Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming uh, today. My name is uh, Carlos Vargas Silva. I am the director of COMPASS at the University of Oxford. Um, I am also the principal investigator for the Reminder project. Uh, this event today is uh, 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 it's going to showcase uh, some of the research of the Reminder project, which is a three-year project funded by the European Commission. And it is about migration uh, within the EU, and obviously Brexit is a very important uh, component of that uh, migration. When we planned the, the event for today, we were expecting this to be Brexit week, so we were expecting to leave the European Union in two days. As all of you know, that's not going to happen for a while. But in any case, it's very useful to get together today with some experts to discuss the future of migration in the UK after uh, Brexit. The idea is that we will have a conversation between the different uh, uh, speakers today. Uh, there will be a, a lot of time at the end for questions. Uh, so please hold your questions to the end. We will leave at least 20 minutes to have a conversation uh, with the public. Uh, as a matter of introduction, I want to introduce the three speakers uh, uh, for today. First of all, on my left is Madeline Sumption, who is the director of the Migration Observatory at the University of Oxford, which is the, the main source of information on migration debates uh, in the UK. She's also a member of the Migration Advisory Committee, the MAC, which is the main group advising the UK government on migration issues. And she's also the chair of the Migration Statistics User Forum in the UK. On my right is Robert McNeil, who is the deputy director of the observatory, also the head of media and communication at Compass. He is a former journalist uh, by profession. And in the Reminder Project, he was examining uh, the media coverage of migration, and he covered this uh, in many countries. He's going to be uh, uh, telling us more about that. And finally, on the left, there's Owanga Kone, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Compass. Uh, his doctoral dissertation was actually about the expansion of the EU in 2004 and how that expansion changed the characteristics of migrants uh, coming to the UK from new EU member states. In the Reminder project, he's exploring how the Brexit vote and related factors have affected the behavior of EU nationals uh, in the UK. So in order to set the scene and start the conversation, I would like to invite Madeleine to tell us more about why do we care about this? Why is EU migration important in the UK? And for which sectors or parts of the population is this very important? Thanks. So uh, historically, EU migration was not that important. Um, most of migration until 2004 came from outside of, of the EU, and there wasn't really that much discussion. In fact, when you try and go back and look at some of the statistics, a lot of them didn't even bother to write the EU non-EU breakdown because it just wasn't really considered the, the main thing of interest. And that really changed um, for a number of reasons. The first thing, of course, was EU enlargement in 2004, which then um, brought uh, significant numbers of people, particularly from Poland, to, to the UK. Uh, making Poland uh, one of the, well, the largest uh, single migrant uh, group in, in the country. But, um, and then also after the, uh, the financial crisis, uh, we had a period when there was um, very significant immigration from, um, from Southern European countries, uh, particularly when, as the UK economy was starting to recover, but there was still really high unemployment in, uh, in Southern Europe. Um, so, and that um, meant that, at least up to the referendum, the, the majority of the growth in the migrant population was actually coming from, from EU countries. Now, in terms of the role of that in the labour market um, and across the economy, um, the, so EU citizens are working right across the spectrum of, of jobs in the UK economy. The bit that we hear most about in the, the policy debate is, um, is their role in low-wage jobs, um, and particularly um, uh, EU citizens from new member states are concentrated in low-wage jobs in retail, hospitality, seasonal agricultural work. Um, but we also see concentrations of um, EU citizens in um, research and education, for example, particularly people from um, the older EU member states. The impacts of this, actually, you know, despite the fact that it's been quite a transformation of the migration landscape, most of the... Um, Economic research suggests that the, the impacts on things like wages or employment has actually been pretty small, surprisingly small. Um, that's, that's on average. There are, of course, um, 
particular industries that are really heavily reliant on EU citizens. Um, so we're looking, for example, the vast majority of seasonal agricultural workers estimated from, uh, to be from the EU. And there are some food processing jobs where it's around 40% and then kind of higher in some areas. So I think where we find ourselves now is an interesting position where we're saying, actually, on average, the impacts have been, have been surprisingly small, but there are certain industries that have really grown as a result of the availability of that supply of labor that are heavily reliant, they've built business models that are reliant on free movement. And now we're um, likely to be in a situation where that um, uh, free movement comes to an end, that's scaled back. And the, the big question is going to be how do those industries adjust? Well, it's interesting because I'm sure we have a lot of students here who are from the, from the EU. So EU migrants come in many different types. Now, Rob, if I can follow on, you can follow on from something that Madeline mentioned. These impacts, these economic impacts, the estimated impacts have been small, right? The, the actual impacts of EU migration. Now, how is the coverage media of this migration? Does it follow the same patterns of the impact or is media playing a major role? Well, <clears throat> that's a, it's a fairly difficult question to answer, really. I mean, what we know is that media organizations in the UK um, are, I mean, they're somewhat different to media organizations in other in other European countries. And the way that journalists have operated in terms of reporting on migration from the EU has been very, very different in the UK to the reporting of migration in other European countries, specifically the reporting of intra-EU migration in other European countries. And I think what we particularly see is that the sort of the structure of the even the idea of being a journalist in the UK is different to the idea of uh, so the choices that people make to go into the profession seems different in the UK from in say Germany or Sweden for example and those motivations the sort of the the, the factors that shape why somebody goes into these into these roles has an impact on the way that issues like intra EU mobility are reported so for example <clears throat> uh, the UK. I mean, obviously, we saw a very, very substantial increase in the number of people uh, from European countries that were coming to the UK after 2004. Um, and a big focus in the British media on sort of achieving, uh, you know, on, on, on what that actually, uh, on the implications of that for the, for, the, for the country and for the economy. But that didn't really happen straight away. Initially, the sort of narrative that we saw were, sto were stories about, you know, the Polish plumber, the, these good, hard-working fellows. And actually, at the point where we saw the... And, and generally speaking, there was something of a focus on the idea that actually British workers were a bit lazy and expensive in comparison to these guys. And the, the sort of the focus on the scale of migration at that point in time was not really there, even though that was one of the key points where there was a very, very sharp increase statistically in the number of migrants that were coming to the UK. Um, the big focus, the big change happened around about 2008, well, in the period after 2008 and into 2010 in particular, where the Conservative government introduced the net migration target, at which point the idea that actually that there, that there was a sort of numerical uh, sort of target that we should be focusing on uh, became very apparent. And the, British and the British press focused very hard on whether or not we were succeeding that succeeding in reaching this tens of thousands net migration target. Now, this kind of numerical focus uh, was not present in any of the other countries. The reporters in the other countries that we that we that we dealt with for the Reminder project didn't really cover the sort of the scale of intra-EU mobility in anything like the same kind of way. Um, despite the fact that in countries like Germany, for example, there had also been quite high levels of net migration from, from, from European countries. And so this idea of a kind of like of failing to control something was very, very, very prevalent in the British, in the British press when this, when this stuff, uh, when in reporting on the issue of, uh, of migration and intra-EU mobility, in much the same way that actually we then saw the issue of control being a major factor in reporting on uh, refugee flows after 2014. So, I mean, to answer your question, I mean, I think that there was a, re there was a response to numbers, but the, no the response was actually probably more to policy decisions made by the British government um, than to the actual number to, than to the actual flows, and it wasn't really until after two, after the two thousand and eight um, the two thousand and eight financial crisis 
Um, and the introduction really of an idea that actually there was a problem with competition with British workers, which we hadn't really seen prior to that situation, that we started to see really kind of negative reporting about intra-EU mobility. And then that really, that expanded even further, um, that neg- those sort of negative depictions of low-skilled intra-EU mobility um, after the uh, after Romania and Bulgaria were granted, or in the period leading up to Romania and Bulgaria getting full access to the UK labour market, with a kind of some degree of panic about the prospect that that was going to be a repeat of the Poland situation, we were going to have huge numbers again. So I think it was more a response to policy choices, but it's also something to do with the with the British media's focus on. Uh, going in hard and sort of scalping politicians. They failed to do this, they failed to do that, which was very prevalent um, and very different from other media sort of systems and other uh, other sort of uh, media practices in other European countries. It was interesting. We have identified, I guess, two, two years that had major impact, 2004, which is, you know, the increasing EU migration because you have larger numbers, and 2010, when the government decides that a numerical target is the best way to conduct a migration uh, policy. Uh, so Anga, w- one question, in 2004, it was not only an increase in the number of migrants, also the type of migrant coming changed there because of the change from a system that selected in skills to freedom of movement at, at that point. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, in, uh, after 2004, there was uh, a drastic increase in the number of migrants coming from uh, <coughs> the new member state. Um, when you also look at uh, the type of migrant coming in, uh, meaning you look at the, their uh, education, you look at their age, uh, the type of job they do, uh, for the first two, you actually see that they have very comparable level of education and age at arrival uh, as those uh, who uh, had come before 2004. Uh, where the difference actually is, is in terms of uh, occupational attainment. You see that those who came after 2004 were more likely to be in uh, jobs uh, that require low level of of qualification. Uh, Something interesting there, however, is that when you actually account for the regional distribution, you see that this propensity to be employed in those uh, low-skill occupations goes down quite drastically, uh, in a sense that kind of suggests that they they were responding to local labor demand, in a sense. So they were going to places where uh, uh, essentially people needed uh, uh, em- employees. Uh, to some extent, you could also argue they were also downgrading uh, occupation. They were taking jobs uh, that required less skills than their own skills. Uh, uh, to, 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 to a large extent. And partly, if you think of it as uh, comparing those who came under a visa system to those who came under no visa system, someone who came under a visa system would be tied to an employer. So their freedom to move around the country is slightly limited. Whereas someone who comes in uh, under no visa restriction is free to move around in a sense. Uh, and doesn't really need uh, employer sponsorship uh, to come in. So they're not really tied to uh, an employer. So to a large degree, how we got here, there was a change in policy that led led to larger numbers. There was a new geography of migrant destinations, and there was a new government policy uh, on this. Now, today, tonight should be more about what happens after Brexit. So let's concentrate on that. Uh, Madeline, you have been there as part of the Migration Advisory Committee with uh, members of the government, of the different governments, and you, have a, you must have some idea of what the new Brexit migration system is, if Brexit happens at, at some point. Uh, can you tell us what is the current thinking in the government about the future migration system? So there's still some uncertainty about this. We don't have um, the official announcement of what the final policy is. Um, that theoretically is due next year for a system that will be implemented at the beginning of 2021. Although, of course, um, all of this depends on the Brexit timetable. And if that's um, delayed, then so would be the introduction of of the new immigration system. The general picture we have, there was a white paper that was published um, at the end of 2018 that laid out the overall architecture of future immigration system. Um, 
And that is the uh, still the main statement of policy, although Boris Johnson's administration have not said very much at all about that white paper and how much of it is still policy. But for the moment, we're plowing ahead, assuming that apart from some kind of known changes that have been announced, that's policy. And what the white paper lays out essentially is um, ending free movement and introducing a skill selective immigration system. Um, and the two main principles of this would be that, broadly speaking, EU and non-EU citizens are treated in the same way. So they would have to meet the same, uh, the same visa requirements if they're coming for family unification, then they would need to meet, for example, the 18,600 pound income requirement for couples who want to live together in the UK. Um, so EU citizens essentially would be brought into the same system as, as non-EU citizens, <coughs> but that system would also be changed. And so um, there would be uh, some liberalization for skilled jobs, so some of the kind of, uh, bureaucratic restrictions around um, skilled workers coming to the UK would, would be loosened. Um, and at the same time, you would have much more limited routes for employer-sponsored immigration in low-wage jobs. So that's a big, in some respects, that's a big departure from the status quo. Essentially, you have now um, free movement with no restrictions into any job. The new system would be very much focused on, on skilled jobs. But there is this one exception, actually, which was really interesting um, in the white paper, and I think actually quite a radical policy, which is that alongside quite a restrictive skills-based immigration system, it also proposes actually an incredibly liberal short-term migration visa that it is assumed would be open to all EU citizens and some and people from some other countries, that uh, which would allow people to come for a year, work in any job, be employed or self-employed, essentially a, a little bit like free movement in the sense that there's no selection on skills except with way fewer rights. So they wouldn't have um, it would be strictly temporary and and there would be no rights to to benefits, for example. Um, but uh, but that, and it. The idea is it would be uncapped, so very liberal system, but strictly temporary. So people would not be able to stay beyond the year and potentially not be able to switch into other routes. So the kind of future system is really, at least if that's still the architecture of the system that we could expect, is really in two halves. It's kind of a restrictive um, system for most uh, for towards most workers coming through the standard employer-sponsored routes, um, but there's actually very liberal. Uh, form of short-term migration that for which it's actually quite difficult to find any precedents around the world. Well, that, that's interesting. So is it the case that maybe after Brexit, we will not see a reduction in migration to the UK? I think we will see a reduction. Um, Certainly we will see a reduction in, well, certainly, nothing is certain, but it is very likely that we'll see a reduction in net migration and the growth of the migrant population. For skilled workers, we're likely to see a reduction just because currently there are no barriers to skilled work. You can show up, you can work in a restaurant while you're looking for a skilled job. You can, you know, that route is very open and it's very easy for people to use. Whereas the new system would require people to line up employer sponsorship. There may be charges, all sorts of fees that people would have to pay. So for sure, you know, just Mathematically, it, the UK would have to become less attractive to, to skilled uh, EU migrants. On the, in terms of the low and middle wage jobs, um, there it's quite difficult to predict. You could potentially have quite significant inflows of people, um, but then they'd be leaving after a year. So that would reduce the net growth. Of course, it does raise all sorts of questions about, um, about churn. So when we're talking about the impacts of, of migration, one of the things that a lot of people in um, local authorities raise, for example, is they're worried about um, the kind of arrival of new people who aren't familiar with um, you know, how to do business, how to register with a GP, some of these basic transactions of, of everyday life. And so if a higher share of your, of your migrant population have only just arrived because that's the structure of the immigration system, then, um, then it does imply that there would be more churn and turnover and potentially some of the problems associated with that. So Rob, one thing that is different in this system that Myling is explaining is that there's no numerical target. This numerical target disappears. Uh, in your remarks, you were kind of highlighting that this numerical target was one of the things that was driving uh, migration, uh, a coverage of migration in the media. So do you expect after Brexit, then coverage is going to be different if this migration target is not there? Um, <clears throat> I think that's already starting to happen. I mean, I think that actually the fact that we've seen declining net migration over the last, over the last couple of years since the vote 
um, let alone what's going to happen after Brexit, means that there's been a move away from that focus on the net migration target anyway. The other problem with the net migration target as well is that it's been broadly discredited. It doesn't really, there's no real expectation anymore from anyone that that's something that was going to be met. Um, but I think just in terms of thinking about the future direction of media coverage about migration broadly, I mean, one of the, I mean, <clears throat> One of the things that, that Madeleine talked about, this temporary, like, temporary low-skilled migration, I mean, that could have a big impact on the way that the media covers things in the future. It's the kind of thing that it's likely, if it does generate large flows of temporary migrants, it's going to have some sort of impact in the way that the issue gets reported, especially if there's a lot of churn, if there's no massive, uh, if there's no massive incentive for people to, uh, to integrate into British society because they're only going to be in the country for a year. The way that those kind of people are likely to be perceived in the communities that they arrive in and the way the media is likely to respond to them would be like, I would, I would anticipate would not be necessarily particularly positive. But I think there are other things as well that are going to shape the way that media covers the issue of migration and intra-EU migration after Brexit. One of which is that we have this fundamental cleavage in the UK now between the Brexiteers and the Remainers. You know, I mean, now we obviously they, this characterises the kind of media coverage that we see already, particularly in newspapers about migration. But I don't think that's going to go away. And so we have to kind of try to come to terms with what a kind of new media landscape is going to look like, which is still characterised by selling newspapers, essentially, or selling a media product to consumers who fundamentally identify as either Brexiteer or Remainer in a world where obviously a choice, yeah, presuming that, it, that we actually do leave, in a world where we are then, you know, we're then in a post-leave environment. So that's going to shape the kinds of coverage that we get. And I would imagine that it's going to, that it's going to continue polarising British society. I mean, maybe, maybe there'll be a move away. I mean, maybe Boris is kind of... Uh, big gambit that we can all just get on with it and move uh, move on maybe that's right but i i don't it, i don't see any evidence that that's likely to happen and i think that considering media respond to public attitudes to things um there is likely to be that increased that or continued polarization of society um uh, but i also think the other, the other thing to bear in mind as well from that perspective is that News organisations, I mean, they're, they're kind of, they're sort of, and, and particularly news organisations that are selling a product and take a political position on something, as British newspapers tend to do, which obviously shape British debate to a greater or lesser extent. They have a sort of a vested interest in not being seen to have got it wrong. If they are seen to have got it wrong, that undermines the product to some extent. And I think that on the subject of migration and on the subject of Brexit, again, that kind of, that, that need that they're going to have to, to tell their consumers or to tell their readers, we got it right, this, you know, look at this example, look at this case study of, that demonstrates why we got it right. That's going to also characterise the nature of debate around these issues in the future. So you are going to have, I would imagine, the Guardian demonstrating repeatedly that there were that that leaving was catastrophic economically and socially while the while the mail and the sun prove once again that you know if we had remained in the EU that would have been an economic or social disaster for us so i think that those things are going to continue to i mean it, it's obviously a bit predictable but i think that that's it's a very real thing the cleavages in society now are are going to continue after Brexit. And that's going to shape the way that we read about migration and the way that we read about the EU generally. But of course, in the media, these things can change very quickly. Of course, uh, last week we had the, the, the sad news of the tragedy of mm. 39 people uh, yep. dying. Now, of course, that increased coverage of migration exponentially. Yep. And I don't know if it changes the tone of the coverage, but certainly... Uh, migration was back in the news very quickly. Uh, no, I think that's absolutely <laughs> right, and I think that 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 one of the things that you saw, one of the things that we have tracked over the last ten years or so, um, our colleague Will Allen, who's done a lot of tracking of kind of uh, the quantitative sort of media analysis, looking at how, what how much coverage there is about different kinds of issues, he's shown that there's been a decline over the last ten years or so in the focus on whether or not people are regular or irregular, you know, whether there's illegal immigration going on or versus the scale of migration. So he's demonstrated that, that, that during the period where 
intra-EU mobility contributed substantially to a big increase in net migration to the UK. That focus in the British media on the scale of migration increased more and more while the focus on people's legal status partly to do with the fact that actually if you're if you're you know if you're a european migrant and that this was where most of the debate was then you can't re i mean you can be here without regular status but it's much more difficult that sort of dropped off substantially and so i think that we're going to move we're likely to move back again to this debate about illegal immigrants a lot more it seems quite likely and i think that you're right also to point out that things can turn around very quickly and the windrush uh, coverage from last year i mean the 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 issues relating to the hostile environment policies and the impact that they were having on particularly older caribbean migrants i mean that was a demonstration of actually how my presumptions about how media works and what they do can often be completely confounded the fact that we suddenly ended up in a situation where all media i mean including the right wing press were essentially cheerleading for an you know for for a more liberal migration policy a more a more a less aggressive approach to managing irregular migration or people who didn't who were unable to prove their status suggest that actually you know there is quite a lot of um quite a lot of sympathy for people mm-hmm. if they are able to demonstrate i mean if they are able to demonstrate certain qualities that people approve of like they contributed and they tried and all this kind of stuff um and i think that the windrush sit the windrush issue where people were unable to necessarily prove their legal rights to be in the country um also potentially sets us up for another EU related issue which is the settled status question you know those people who failed to acquire settled status for one reason or another what's going to happen to them in the future and i can imagine that we're going to see a lot of media coverage about people who consider themselves to be settled uk residents who should have every right to stay here and who are suddenly finding themselves on the wrong side of the home office in one way or another and how the government responds to those people is likely to have a substantial impact i think on the kind of case studies that we see over the next well in 10 or even 15 years time for well, the thing that's important madeline that this eu settlement scheme that has been launched by the government Can you tell us a bit about how the scheme works and are there any problems with the schemes? Are there any groups of the population that are unlikely to get registered at all? So this, I mean, in some ways, this is the biggest single issue in the immigration um, debate at the moment. Um, the, the government uh, is planning to end free movement and it wants to bring um, everyone who's come here under free movement rules into, uh, it wants to give them a UK immigration status. Now, in order to do that, its uh, proposal is a, um, uh, what's called the EU settlement scheme. So this is a program that EU citizens have to apply for in order to re- retain their legal right to to be in the UK. It's not a registration in the sense that if they don't apply for it, the default policy position at the moment um, is that uh, is that they lose their status. So they become, after the deadline passes, they become irregular migrants. Um, now, uh, there are a number of points of debate in this scheme. The, the government has designed it so that it should uh, be as easy as possible for people to apply. And most people actually it's, you know, would find it to be a very quick application. They don't need to necessarily send in any documents. Um, they, the government has developed um, a, a system to dip into other government databases <coughs> to check someone's residence status and so that they don't have to um, you know, spend a lot of time gathering documents to show that, they, that they've been living here. Um, the, the complications, um, come, there, well, there are a couple of, of different complications that we might see in the scheme. The first is specific vulnerable groups. So this um, would include, uh, there, are number, um, there are lots of different forms of vulnerability, but anyone who um, has been a victim of exploitation of any kind, um, non-EU partners who are victims of domestic abuse, for example, there are a number of people who are in a very difficult personal situation, in some cases without documentation to prove their right to, uh, that, without documentation to prove that they're, that they're living here and that they're eligible for the scheme. So there are some concerns about those groups. There are also some concerns that even actually people who are not that vulnerable um, simply won't come forward and apply for the scheme. The government, ha- there's no list of EU citizens who are living here. There's never been any registration requirement. So the government doesn't know who they are. Um, they have to come forward and, and apply. And um, one of the things, you know, it's difficult to predict how many people simply won't apply. 
But uh, one of the things that we know from looking across other government programs, whether it's, you know, people claiming child benefit, um, which is basically, you know, free money if you have a child or people um, filing their tax returns on time in order to avoid a financial penalty, people don't always do what's in their interest. And so it, it's very unlikely that you're going to get 100% of people um, all do what they're expected to do, kind of know about the scheme, get round to doing it, um, and secure their state and kind of fully understand the implications for their immigration status. Um, so the, and with obviously, um, you know, over 3 million people, somewhere between 3 and 4 million people probably that, that need to apply for the scheme, um, even a pretty small percentage of, of that, if they don't apply, is, is quite a large number of people who at least under the default policy scenario currently become irregular migrants after the deadline. The, so the big question, I think, probably the biggest single question about the scheme is what happens to people who haven't applied after the deadline. Now, some people have proposed that actually um, you should scrap the deadline entirely, make it a registration, say you have these rights, you just need to come forward in order to, um, to be able to get the, the paperwork, you need to be able to demonstrate it. Um, but uh, if that doesn't happen, then the government has said it will take a proportionate approach to people who miss the deadline where there's a good reason. Now, will I forgot be a good reason? <laughs> Difficult to say. Um, but this, I think, um, uh, will be a big issue. And I think actually kind of from a political perspective, um, I actually think there's an argument that the government may be forced into taking a very generous approach or indeed making it... Um, a registration rather than application, um, simply because in this coming back to the media again, once if you start to see that there are um, people who are seen as sympathetic characters, particularly by the press, um, who find themselves having lost their, their immigration status, it's actually quite difficult to imagine the government going ahead and, and saying, well, sorry, didn't apply in time. So, so that's that. So I, I suspect this is something I, I suspect we may see a number of developments in the actual policy as the scheme is, is rolled out. And just to be clear, uh, there's no way for the government to know who has applied or not applied, so who's out there. And that means there will be almost no way for the government to know how many people uh, <coughs> didn't uh, apply in the scheme. So this new irregular migrant population will have an unknown number. Yes, the the yeah, this is, I mean, this is another um, big <laughs> issue. We have some, there are some official estimates of the size of the EU citizen um, population, but um, we know that those estimates are too low. They, there are certain people that just by design aren't included um, in the estimates. So for example, people who don't live at private addresses, people who are at care homes or hostels or what have you. Um, there are some other reasons that we <coughs> believe that that data source is likely to underestimate the number of people, particularly recent arrivals. Um, and so we will be in a position at the end, depending on how many people the government has granted status to by the end of by the end of the process. We could well be in a position where actually hundreds of thousands of people don't have status, and we have no way of telling from from the statistics. There are some, you know, if the government really cares, there are some statistical things that they can do to work it out. Um, mm -hmm. But um, but the, the default position, based on what we have available at the moment, is yeah, we may simply not know. Uh, so one of, one of the things uh, that is changing for. EU nationals is this idea of the settlement scheme, but many other things have changed. So the, the value of the British pound mm -hmm. has changed in recent years. The probability of returning home or join, being joined by, by, by family members have changed. Mm -hmm. um, in your research, you have looked at how some of these uh, factors have affected EU nationals living here. What have you found in that research? Um, for, so what we uh, see uh, in the data for now is that after the referendum vote, uh, after June uh, 2016, you see that the uh, weekly hours worked by uh, EU migrants have gone up uh, uh, slightly. Um, and when you try to understand why this is the case, uh, you see that it's largely due to uh, fluctuations in uh, exchange rates, uh, which is in kind of in line with uh, the, the economics literature, in the sense that if you in the country and uh, the value of the currency goes up, it means the money you're sending to your home country uh, can then afford more. Uh, so you can afford to send slightly less and you would have the same level of good that uh, you used to, to buy. Uh, if the value of the currency goes down, uh, it means that one pound now would uh, afford you less in your home country, so you'd need to send more money. And if um, 
work is your main source of revenue, if not your only source of revenue, then what you can do to uh, adjust to this change is to work a little bit more so that you have a bit more money uh, to send. Uh, but what's interesting in uh, our study is that there's a difference uh, to this general pattern. Uh, we see that after Brexit, uh, any subsequent appreciation in the value of uh, the pound was essentially linked to uh, a slightly different response in a sense that they were cutting down slightly less on numbers of hours work than they would have uh, before Brexit. So to uh, put this uh, in perspective, say normally they would, uh, if the exchange rate uh, goes up by 10%, uh, they would work uh, one, uh, they would uh, cut uh, uh, the numbers of hours work by one hour. Uh, after Brexit, they were cutting it down by say something like 0.7 hours. So not quite. And uh, we think the, the, the hypothesis we have for that is because of return probability. As uh, we were saying earlier in the discussion, uh, immigration is going up, suggesting that many of uh, EU nationals are returning. Uh, so if you plan on returning and uh, the value of the currency in uh, the, the host country goes up, you might think, OK, uh, maybe I'm not going... Uh, to work as much as I used to, but you're not going to cut down your numbers of hours by too much because you might want to save a bit more so that when you go uh, back home in the end, uh, you still have uh, uh, quite a bit of money there. Can I uh, ask so for a clarification as well? Yeah. So, so, I, mm -hmm. so, I mean, this is about the amount of hours that people work. I mean, yeah. You and I have discussed on numerous occasions whether or not this is also going to be a factor in potentially stimulating more emigration or alternatively mm -hmm. reducing people's likelihood of actually immigrating to the UK. Do you think that those currency fluctuations are likely to play into that or not? Yeah, uh, one, uh, one key factor in, uh, uh, in, uh, that determines immigration is uh, wage uh, differences between the host country and uh, the, sending, uh, the, the origin country. Uh, so you move uh, so that you can essentially earn more uh, per unit of hours work. Uh, so if the return to your, uh, your work uh, goes down, uh, then it might encourage some people to, to actually to go back as well because uh, immigration is no longer as beneficial uh, as it used to be. Uh, but in this particular study, that's, this is not what uh, we, we are looking at. But th this is... Uh, yeah, it's uh, definitely it's, uh, a, a possible uh, effect that uh, one can expect. So is this saying that potentially since the Brexit vote, a lot of the change in migration patterns that mm -hmm. we have seen from the EU and from elsewhere mm -hmm. are not only related to Brexit, but are related to the value of the British pound, potentially. And, and I guess that there are many students here. Yeah. It is cheaper to study at Oxford nowadays, right, with the... British pound <laughs> being appreciated, right, mm -hmm. than it would have been in, in the past, right? Uh, yeah. so, so, so these economic factors also play uh, a big role. They, they, they do. Um, even in, in previous studies, uh, there was uh, an, a financial crisis uh, in uh, Asia in the 90s, and um, there's a professor in the US that uses that, and essentially what you see is that it, it generated uh, uh, return return migration uh, by quite by, by a bit. Uh, in uh, the case of uh, students, uh, because now the value of uh, your home currency uh, is high in the UK, so if you're comparing the UK and the US, uh, maybe that might encourage you uh, to move to the UK, uh, for example. So it's a mix of things. Uh, uh, so you, yeah. So if you're watching online and you are a potential student. Now it's cheaper to store in the UK, so please uh, come. I want to open now the conversation to everyone else so we can have participation from others. Uh, feel free to make a comment, ask a question to any of the speakers. Uh, one thing I will let you know, I will repeat your question, or will try to, because for the people who are watching online, there's another microphone for them. So if you see me repeating your question, it's not because you did anything wrong. It's just because we, are, we have people watching online. Uh, Yes, please. Yeah, so it's very practical, the question, but it's because I'm trying to apply for the 
Can you repeat the question before you answer? Um, yes, sure. So um, uh, th this was a question about some practical questions about the EU settlement scheme. I should, I have to give the caveat that uh, I can't give immigration advice. I'm not an immigration lawyer, but I can talk um, broadly about kind of what the policy is. Um, uh, and actually, get, I'll answer your question from a policy perspective, which may actually be less useful for you personally. But on the, so the first question was, what was the deadline? Um, now this actually, so the, the deadline currently is, um, is the end of uh, December 2020 if we leave without a deal. And then there's an additional six month grace period um, if we leave with a deal. But actually all of this depends um, on, uh, that, that assumes that, um, that there's no extended transition period. So we could end up actually with a, a much more distant deadline. We actually, interestingly, we saw a lot of people, as there was a lot of rhetoric over the summer about leaving, about a no deal exit from, from the EU, we saw a, actually a really significant spike in applications. So people kind of worried about, you know, wanting to get it, their status nailed down before EU exit, even though in principle the deadline, you know, there's no need for that, the deadline does, does stretch further. Um, the second question was what data is used to, um, to demonstrate residency. Um, the answer to that is that um, there, um, well, there is a list of, um, of documents that can be provided. If people, the way that the system works is people go in and put in a national insurance number and um, that will then be um, uh, used to check um, for activity in um, databases from the Department of Work and Pensions and um, HMRC, so the tax and benefits records. Um, there isn't a huge amount of information available publicly about how, about exactly what um, information contributes to a kind of positive hit in that system. Um, but the thing that the government emphasizes is, you know, you know while most people um, do get results uh, from, from the database, um, they do, it's not necessary. So you can also upload other documents, things like, for example, um, household, household bills or bank statements and so forth. There's quite a long list of things that, that people can, can provide. And the idea is that it, um, you know, they, the, the government has been reluctant to accept things like personal testimonies, like, you know, this guy lives in my house, um, a type of letters because um, they, they're always worried about um, it not being verifiable, essentially. They want official records. Um, but there is quite a long list of, things that can be provided. Um, and then this final question about um, application versus registration. Um, this, I mean, this is more of a kind of technical policy point. Um, there is so the status that um, is being granted to people um, is a status under UK law. So it's to say if someone gets settled status, if they've been in the country for at least five years, um, then essentially they're getting indefinite leave to remain, which is the same status that non-EU citizens have, except it comes with um, some a uh, few additional rights if they've applied through the settlement scheme. Um, the idea is if it was a registration, then um, when, regardless of exactly the kind of technical legal detail about you know, what status they get, it would probably be the same status, um, people would be considered automatically to hold it. So the act of applying and being granted status wouldn't actually affect the rights that the individual had. The idea is the individual has that status, it's just that um, in practice, they need to be able to demonstrate it if they want to be able to um, get a new job or um, demonstrate their status to a landlord, um, uh, you know, open a bank account, a number of things for which you need to show that you're here legally. Um, then they would need proof of the status. So the idea is a registration is more about um, getting proof of your status, not actually creating the status itself. But for, I mean, this is all very theoretical and for individual applicants, it doesn't make a difference. It's, you know, it's still in their interest just to apply for the scheme. So you should do that as quickly as possible, yeah. You want to no, no, just, just <laughs> that process is quite important in the kind of Windrush component of this whole thing. If you have not applied for something and been granted some sort of, mm -hmm. some sort mm -hmm. of evidence that allows you to prove your status, that's when the problems can potentially arise mm 
down the line. Um, because if somebody then says to you, well, no, you don't have this status and you're not able to provide the document to somebody, then you may find yourself in the long run. Right. And the, the response the that the government problem. gives to the question, why don't they just grant everyone, why don't they consider everyone to have status and not make them apply to the scheme? Why do they want to essentially make people irregular migrants if they haven't applied by the deadline? Their response is Windrush. Um, that basically they want people to get the to get everything sorted out now so that we don't find ourselves in a situation in 20 years' time where people are having to demonstrate what they were doing 20 years ago, which is obviously mm. much more difficult. You know, and the, you know, there have been counter-arguments to that, but that, that's the, the government <coughs> argument. Well, I mean, it's interesting that in all these years from wing rush to now, the government doesn't have a way of simply knowing who is here and who can get the status immediately, right? This part of the system doesn't seem to have improved in all these years. It, I mean, the system is much better now. I mean, the, so the record keeping at the Home Office back from um, you know, the 1970s, for example, they, they don't know who they granted status mm -hmm. to then. Um, that, that has changed. So for the more recent records, um, it, that, uh, you know, that, 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 that isn't a problem. The, the issue is just that EU citizens never had to apply for anything. So in that sense, there is a parallel. So you were going to... No, I wanted to say for, for practical... Uh, uh, advice. There's a report that we wrote on this, the Osseto statute. I think the appendix has uh, a list of uh, the document, if I'm not mistaken, that you, you could uh, could provide. Uh, Very yeah, possibly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we are not immigration lawyers, so it's not uh, immigration <laughs> advice. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, please. So on the panel, um, how do we anticipate that the public and the media will respond? What I found really interesting about the referendum debate was that there was a strain of thought saying that the public weren't concerned about the numbers, it was about lack of control. And people like David Davis were saying that immigration, particularly from Commonwealth countries, may have increased and that the public wouldn't have a problem with this. And there seems to be an interesting kind of divide between liberal, free marketeer Tories who want immigration to increase and a lot of the people who voted for Brexit who want the numbers definitely to decrease. Start with that. Okay, so, so, I mean, this comes back to my point about news, news organisations wanting to be proved right. Um, and a little bit, anyway. And I think that, <clears throat> I mean, this question, I mean, we obviously can't predict how people will do things. I mean, the control issue, it's, you know, the numbers are super high. Oh, my God, we're freaking out. Kind of thing. I mean, it, it's not related to the specific number. It's related to the perception of what the number should be. Yeah, I, I would strongly argue, partly on the basis that we're not seeing a huge number of stories at the moment about net migration being out of control. Whereas when net migration was at exactly the same kind of levels that it is now, say in 2014-ish or something like that, then there was a gigantic panic about this in the media. So it's not necessarily directly related to that. I mean, one of the reasons that we're not seeing those stories now is this perception of control that's been that's been that's emerged from the kind of like, well, we voted for Brexit, therefore it's potentially not going to happen in the future. But in terms of how media are going to respond to it and how the public are going to respond, which I think are two probably very linked factors, I mean, it seems to me unlikely that, especially in the short term, that if, that if net migration, for example, were to increase as a result of Conservative Party policies that, that emerged from a strong pro-Brexit agenda of the Johnson administration after an election where the where Johnson gets a, an overall majority. It seems to me unlikely that you're going to see the right-wing press monstering him for that at this stage. Um, they'd be more likely to say, yes, well, it, this was never about migration in the first place. Whereas if we have an election and there's a Corbyn administration in place and we see exactly the same levels of net migration, we might see a very different narrative about it. So it's not really predictable on the basis of numbers. I think it's about whether or not those vested interests that want to push a certain agenda forwards are, um, are essentially weaponizing the issue of immigration for their own, for their own purposes. That's my, my reading of it. Yeah, you. yeah, no, I mean, I would, I would agree with that. I guess one, one way, one area in which we do see numbers playing a role, I think, is in the salience of, of migration in public opinion. So if you look um, at the, the Ipsos Mori attitudes track over time, they ask people, what's the, you know, what are the top issues in the debate? And we do tend to see that in periods of higher migration, people are more likely to um, 
to think about migration being an issue. Um, it doesn't necessarily kind of play directly into the public. I, th I think you really, it's, that is reasonable because the other thing is, I mean, like I, I possibly sort of set up a bit of a straw man there that, um, that I'm now going <laughs> to knock down. Um, because, I mean, the other thing was growth. Yeah, the rapid growth, mm. I think, played a, played a part in stories about this because that was part of the kind of control thing. And so even though the numbers are now are now what they were in 2014 when people were freaking out, they are <coughs> declining. Net migration is currently mm. declining. But it's also related to government policy. The government basically said, you know, in 2010, there's a technocratic solution to the issue of immigration, which is that it should be at this level and we will do everything that we can to make, to make it at that level. And then they repeatedly failed to do it. And that kind of narrative over and over again, especially with the, the quarterly drumbeat of the net migration statistics that came out, which allowed the press to constantly obsess about a specific number, did create a certain way of doing things. So I think if the policy is not focusing on it, it makes a difference. But I do think growth or decrease also probably plays into that. I think you're right. But isn't another aspect that we now know that migration numbers are not that good and that we don't know how many people are coming and... So to say, we always uh, knew that. We kept telling We always that. knew that, right? Yeah. But the government kept insisting on using them. And now even the government has said that, yeah, the numbers were wrong. We don't know how many people are coming, right? So it's a... Okay, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, I was wondering if, um, how is Brexit sort of influencing the way, like, the way you, you, EU nationals access rights and um, benefits and social protection and worker provisions? Because I was wondering, how Brexit will affect that if it happens, and also how Brexit is affecting it right now. Because my question is now people need to apply, EU nationals need to apply for the settlement scheme. But then I was working for this organization, they said that now to apply for, at the time, a few months ago, to apply for the universal credit, they, 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 they were asking you if you had applied or not, and that was causing some troubles to complete the applications for people that do need the uh, the universal credit is like a welfare benefit. So I'm wondering how how Brexit interacts with the welfare provisions and access to social protection. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Um, yeah. So the question was how um, is will Brexit interact with welfare provisions and social protection, people's eligibility for benefits, and whether they're getting the benefits to which they're entitled. And this actually, um, so this is a really good question. There are actually a couple because it's such a new area. There are a couple of research projects that are ongoing and haven't yet um, uh, generated findings. I mean, one of the concerns is that. Um, uh, that various different agencies in periods of transition when rules are changing and, there are, and people have different kinds of statuses, that um, people implementing policies uh, won't necessarily understand exactly what they're supposed to be doing. And so that applies to government agencies, for example, when they're assessing eligibility uh, for benefits. And there's some concern that um, people are being denied benefits to which actually they, they should be um, entitled because of, of misunderstanding during a period of, of transition. The other big question is, is employers. Do employers understand the status that people have? Currently, you know, obviously we're still a member of the EU um, and so EU citizens' rights have, have not changed at this stage. Employers are not supposed to be asking people whether they, um, they're not supposed to be requiring people to apply to the settlement scheme in order to, to get a job, for example, although there are anecdotal reports that, um, that some of them are doing that just partly because of a misunderstanding of, of what, the, what the law actually says. So this is something I, I don't, other than the kind of anecdata, I don't have a kind of clear answer for this, but it is something that um, there are a number of different research projects looking into because the expectation is that there, there will be an effect. Perfect. There are only five minutes left, so I'm going to take... Uh perhaps like three questions, and, and then we'll finish with that. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, I was wondering, uh, another media question for, for Rob. Um, you spoke a lot about established media outlets. Uh, I was wondering if we live in a world, and I don't dispute, I should say, I don't dispute that they influence uh, certain constituencies, so politicians and uh, certain members of the section of the public, but that both a current pre-Brexit world and a post-Brexit world is one increasingly dominated by what you might call irregular uh, news organisations and what role, if any, they will have in a post-Brexit world and whether or not the project that you've been part of has looked at uh, the Facebooks or the 4 chan or the Reddits of this world um, or if there are other projects that will look at what they're doing with regards to migration debate. Two, two more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like, I would like to take the conversation to the other side. Who is living? Uh, because most of the conversation focused on who is coming, whether they can access the services and 
uh, etc. I'm just wondering what kind of groups you expect to leave the UK? Would they be all EU migrants or do you also expect the UK citizens to leave? Um, yeah. And one last question, uh, please. Who are the people who are not counted now? I mean, I landed in Heathrow this morning, my passport was scanned. And then if you take that, and then you also take the tax records and the social welfare records, who are the people who are, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people that aren't in these databases? Is whenever you are answering one question, just repeat the broad idea of the questions for the listeners online. And I guess you can start with the media. And media. Okay, so this, the question was about whether or not uh, newer, irregular media organizations, which was uh, defined as sort of uh, Facebook, 4chan, and various other things, um, were playing a role in the kind of post-Brexit world more. Um, I think it's unquestionable that social media has completely redefined the way that we have these debates. Um, uh, I think that one of the factors that actually happened, one of the things that happened after 2016, not only because of the Brexit debate, but also because of the Trump election, was Facebook changing the way that its algorithms work to reduce a focus on news. Um, so... There's a change from that perspective, but I mean, I think that in the new digital world, we certainly, um, we, you know, we certainly have to contend with different forms of information, different types of news outlets that push us in different directions. So yes, I mean, yes, we have to bear that in mind. I still think, to be honest with you, that certainly UK public debate is dominated by the kind of legacy media, you know, these kind of these mega organisations ranging from obviously the BBC and the broadcast media on one side through to the newspapers on the other side. And as yet, none of those smaller kind of media organisations, well, I mean, obviously Facebook doesn't count in that in that perspective and social media organisations don't, but that's so they're, they're means of distribution, distributing existing content from other places rather than necessarily producers in their own right. And so as far as the kind of news producers are concerned, <coughs> I don't think that any of them have yet cut through to have the same kind of impact as the serious, as the sort of legacy media. Though, I mean, we see more and more organisations like Breitbart, for example, um, like even even these kind of these, uh, these essentially propaganda, propaganda outputs like RT and Sputnik playing more and more of a role in shaping public debate. And that may happen more and more. Um, yep. This is, do you want to answer um, the one about who are these people who are... Yes, who are the people who, who are not counted. Um, so the, the, way, the official um, estimates of the number of EU citizens in the country um, actually come, they don't come from um, uh, records at the border. They come from a household survey conducted by the Office of National Statistics. Um, and that explicitly excludes, um, I mentioned the people who live in, who don't live at private addresses. Um, it um, also undercounts certain people. So statistically, people who are out of the um, country for part of the year are less likely to be in there. Um, there's an issue around the counting of dual citizens, uh, particularly EU, non-EU dual citizens, because only one citizenship is, is captured. Um, but actually, I think the kind of, that there's another really big unknown, which of course this is a, a response uh, a survey with a declining response rate around actually not that far of 50%. And so the concern is that um, the people who choose not to respond to the survey may be more likely to have particular characteristics. Now in the past, we've known that um, being a migrant has been one of those characteristics that made people less likely to respond to the survey, but it's a, a big unknown and we don't really, um, we don't have a great view of that now. It is all changing um, because migration stats in a few years time will be generated much more from administrative records. And there again, it's probably not so much gonna be border checks, but um, uh, the tax and benefits records that actually pick up, um, you know, the vast majority of people living in, in the UK, possibly also NHS records. That should give us um, a more accurate picture of, um, of how many EU citizens are here. Whether we'll have those data in time for the completion of the settlement scheme is a totally different question. So if, if Brexit were to happen in Sweden or Norway, they will push a button and they will know immediately, broadly, who is in and out, right? Or, um, they'd be in much better shape. There are still even countries with population registers. You know, there are some issues that <laughs> population registers are not always totally up to date. People may have may have left the country. Mm -hmm. There are some unregistered people. Um, but yes, certainly um, it, it would be much easier in those countries that had records of, of every individual. Perfect. And so if you can comment on immigration and, and as before, if you can repeat the yeah. question broadly. 
uh, the question was uh, who is leaving and uh, if uh, also you have uh, UK nationals uh, leaving. Uh, in terms of who is leaving, the, uh, the individual characteristics are not also recorded. You can know by uh, nationality. Uh, and what you see is that uh, the, the rate of change uh, has, has been quite high among uh, national of uh, Eastern and Central European countries. Uh, so in, in fact, now net uh, immigration for these people uh, is, is, uh, is negative. So you have more uh, people leaving than, than coming in. Uh, for pre-existing, uh, for nationals of uh, pre-existing member states before 2004, uh, net migration rates are, uh, uh, levels are still uh, positive. Uh, but you still see that there's, uh, there's uh, an increase in the number of, uh, of, of those uh, leaving. Uh, in terms of uh, UK national, something that we know for sure, mm. uh, based on uh, data uh, in uh, other European countries, is that there's uh, an increase in the number of uh, acquisition of uh, uh, European citizenship. Uh, so if you take that as a proxy for people wanting to, to stay there or having the flexibility of going there after Brexit, that would be uh, a good indication. I can feel we have a, a new blog in the Compass website that talks about exactly this, exactly. this same issue. So thank you everyone for coming. Let's give an applause to our speakers.